to the message because um, there, I really believe, like I keep saying, there's something that God wants to do tonight. We're going to come back and worship because that is part of the message. In fact, it's not a piece of it. It's a big, big, big part of what, where we're at in this season. So, you guys want to take a break? And um, everybody go ahead and sit down. And I think my wife is going to start us off. All right. Well, it's so good to have each one of you here. And I'm excited about what God is stirring, what he's wanting to do. Tonight is special. Um, we're celebrating as our first fruits. And we've hinted here and there about first fruits and what it is. Uh, but tonight we get to enter into it more fully. So tonight is about experiencing God's blessings. How many of you want more of God's blessings? I do. <laughs> And so this is just a time to understand deeper how God wants to, to do that in our lives. First fruits obviously is based on the principle of first. You look throughout scripture and the firsts are very important. And here Jesus said in Matthew 6.33, But seek first the kingdom of God and what? All these things will be added. And you know we know this verse up here. But sometimes it's hard to act it out in our lives, of giving God the first of our resources, to give God the first of our time, to give God the first of everything. Sometimes when we're faced with a crisis, you know, we're trying to figure things out, and we go here, we go there, and it tends to be, you know, the last thing we finally, in desperation, go, oh God, what do you want to do? And so entering into first phrase is just about learning how to flow in the rhythm of God's timing which, as you'll see shortly, is very different from our own timing. God gave us, in the very beginning, time as a gift. Yes. And his intention is that we would flow in that timing and be blessed by it. But, as we all know, we have an enemy who does not want us to receive God's blessing, wants to get us out of God's timing, and get really messed up so we don't receive the fullness of that blessing. So Daniel 7.25 uh, talks about he intends to change times and laws. The enemy wants to try to distract us, get us really busy, get us off track, so that we don't receive the fullness of blessing that God intends for us. Now, you know when we look at the news and see you know, the big accident that happened, and realize that only a few seconds made the difference between potentially life and death. You know, if they'd just been a little slower or a little faster, that accident wouldn't ha have happened. And that's kind of how the enemy tries to get us out of God's timing so that we, can't, we won't fulfill his destiny. Um, and so I'm going to show a very humorous video clip. Um, Sean, is the sound turned up for this? Yeah. Just to kind of illustrate that uh, bad timing. This has a fractured food a lot of well, so we can be able to go tomorrow. Dad is going to be so excited. <laughs> that killed him. <laughs> bad timing. We don't want to be in bad timing. We want to be in God's timing. Uh, you know, I honestly, I'm just, I have some stuff prepared here, but at the same time, I just feel like that, um, you know, God's wanting us to enter into something, and that it's, it can be really powerful, and getting into his timing is so valuable and so important that we really need to understand the season that we're in. So, there we go. God has a calendar, right? Do, how many of you know that he has his, his calendar? Yep. His own calendar. And how many of you know that he didn't change and when we all went to the Gregorian calendar, God said, oh, sorry guys, I was on mine, I'll get on yours. You know, he didn't do that. He stuck with his because it has meaning behind it. And it has meaning in, in the totality of the universe and what he is as our creator God. He's in charge, not us. So it says here, let there be lights in the firmament in the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. 
seasons are appointed times, and these are described are describing the feasts and festivals and so forth. That we'll get into as we go on. There's like so much there. It's it, it's incredible what God has for us. But right now, I'm gonna. We're in the month of Tammuz, which is the Hebrew month. It's the fourth month. And in the month of Tammuz, there was a lot of things that took place. Now, this, in correlation to our calendar, is June 17th through July 16th. So we're right in the middle of it now. Normally, we're going to do first fruits right toward the beginning of each month. And there's a message. There's a message in each and every month that God has already given to us. The uh, Jewish people have a very clear vision of that. <clears throat> and as we move into it and begin to see it, what we did, uh, we took a group of those who feel like they hear from God and wanted to hear from God, and, and, and you know, it was a prophetic group that we met on Friday night. Because we already see some of the things in, in the Bible, what God is telling us. But we also want to know, has He got something fresh for us right now today? And God gave us several things. Several things that we need to be aware of that He's giving to us in our community, our group, to listen to. To listen and be ready. To be ready to move on it. So here's some things. We are in a season where we get to choose. Do we want to be under pressure? Or do we want to be in His presence? Which would you rather be in? In His presence. So basically anyone right now experiencing any pressure, let it go. So Friday night, I was uh, expressing how I had been making phone calls. I've been sending out emails. I've been sending out texts for a specific thing. And I was getting absolutely nothing back. Nobody was responding to me. And I finally realized Friday night as we're praying, wow, I've made this thing an idol. I am so, I've got this thing so tightly by the neck, it's become an idol. And when I noticed that and God revealed that to me on Friday night, I released it. Because I don't want an idol. You're going to find in a moment that's partly what this month carries with it is the idolatry that took place. So, I let go of it. What happens the next morning? So I release it. The next morning, I get a response. So, that to me was just purely the, the you know, sign from God that I was in the wrong because I made an idol of this thing. I was holding on to it rather than waiting, rather than waiting on the Lord to take care of it and deal with it. I'm you know, and I can look back now and I can say, I was wrong. I knew I was wrong, but I couldn't. I wasn't disengaging. I was still holding on to that golden calf. So that's one of the things that took place in this month. The golden calf in the month of Tammuz. And the Israelites look at it, they call it, uh, they, were, they, they say they were six hours from eternity. Now, I don't agree, agree with their theology. You know, because they have a totally, you know, different route that they were taking. But the point is, Moses had gone up the mountain. And he was up there for 40 days and 40 nights in the cloud with God. And all the people are down in the valley and they're saying, what's happened to this man? Where has he gone? Why hasn't he come back? We need something to follow. We need someone to follow. And so they appeal to Aaron. And what's Aaron do? He caves. He says, all right, bring me all your gold. Bring me your silver, your jewelry, all your earrings. And what's he do? He makes the golden calf to appease everybody. And they say if they'd waited six more hours, Moses would have been down off the mountain. They'd waited for 40 days and 40 nights. If they'd waited just a little bit longer, they would have been in a whole different, a whole, a whole new place, a whole different place with God. Now we, we can also see it in Ishmael, right? Abraham birthed Ishmael because he failed to wait. Samuel failed to wait, and it cost him his kingship. There were so many things where people failed to wait. And sometimes we get, you know, we get so, we, we hold on so tight to something, and this is why this season is so important. I want you to think about this. What are you holding on to so tightly that you need to be letting go of? That you need to just let go and wait. Believe me, this is the season to let go and wait. Worship or waffle. If the pressure's on, the remedy is to worship. So that's why tonight it's like we've got to enter into the exuberant worship. 
We've got to enter into that because it is the remedy for this season to keep us from committing idolatry. Letting go of everything that we're holding on to and wanting an answer to right now and releasing it. Some of you are going to find out that once you release it, you'll get an answer right away. Yep. So this is just a piece of what we're wanting to share tonight. Um, there, there's a lot of details I could go through, but just for instance, let me share with you some of the things that have happened in the month of Tammuz in Scripture. I'm not going to go into each and every scripture, but you'll, you know it's there. Um, number one, like I said, the golden calf, that took place. On that day, 3,000 men died. Then uh, later on, Manasseh, King Manasseh, sets up an idol in the same month of Tammuz. He sets up an idol in the holy place. Later, on the 9th of Tammuz, in Jerusalem, it is destroyed and the daily sacrifice ceases. It's on the 17th of Tammuz, years later, that Nebuchadnezzar breaches the walls of Jerusalem. Years later, on the 10th, King Zedekiah is captured. And then it's in the month of Tammuz that Titus and Rome breach the walls of Jerusalem, beginning the end of the Second Temple. So for the Jews, this is a very sad month. Very sad month. Now for us, we have a very simple remedy. Worship. Enter into that place of exuberant worship. That is the remedy that will keep us from committing idolatry and hanging on to those things that we're supposed to be letting go of. Let God be God. God is not scratching his head trying to figure out how to solve your problem. He's got a plan. The question is, will you let him reveal his plan? Or are you still holding on to wanting to do things your way? So it's letting go in this season. Worshiping God exuberantly and letting go of anything that you may be holding on to as an idol. I'm going to stop there and let my wife pick up. <laughs> All right. You'll notice the difference between Gil and I is that he's non-linear and I'm linear. <laughs> and so um, he gets to make sure that I'm not um, idolizing a linear presentation. <laughs> so we get to we get to have fun. <laughs> and so as you mentioned, God's calendar in the sky, and it's very different from our own in that the the beginning of, of the first month was the new moon, and as soon as the moon first the new moon showed up, then that they would know that was their new month and be able to enter into it. And so we're just going to look at some of God's appointed times. There was the daily, where we read in Genesis 3.8 that they heard the sound of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And so it appears that there was a regular time that God would meet with them in the garden in the cool of the day. Many people think that was evening, but it could be morning too. I don't know. You know, it's cool in the morning as well. But looking at the daily cycle... For us in our Western mindset, the day begins when? The new day? Well, technically midnight, but hopefully most of us are in bed at that time. And so our new day, we just see it as beginning, you know, whenever we get up in the morning. And our tendency is, well, I've just rested all night, and I've got all these things to do, and we jump into our day, and we get going, and we work all day long, and then we get to the end of our day, and the sun goes down, and we're just exhausted, and we go, wow, I worked hard all day and I can't do anything more, so God, the rest is up to you. But it's very interesting that God's model of day and night was very different. We see in, in the book of Genesis that he said the evening and the morning is the first day. The evening and the morning was the second day. And so in, in biblical reckoning, the new day begins at sunset the night before. And you go, well, who cares? It's about six hours difference, you know? But it really does. There's a shift in mentality when we go, it's evening, I'm tired. I'm going to enter into this new day from a perspective of rest. Yes. I can't do anything more. God, I thank you that all night long while I'm sleeping, you're working on my behalf. And then when we wake up in the morning, it's not like rushing out and doing our own thing. It's like, God, how do I partner with what you have already been doing all day long? And so it's just, it's a subtle shift in how we view time. 
And so again, you know, some people have these, these debates over when you should have devotions. And some people, morning people are like, you've got to have it in the morning. And evening people are like, oh, it's got to be in the evening. Well, it doesn't matter which way you do it. But it's at the cool of the day time where you have an appointment with God. The next one is the weekly Sabbath. They would count off seven days. That seventh day would be a time of rest, of unplugging. Again, God originated this in the very, very beginning. Now, many of you know this about us, that um, we used to be Seventh-day Adventist, and I was actually raised Seventh-day Adventist. And we kept very religiously the Sabbath from sundown Friday night to sundown Saturday night. And they would even print in the bulletin when the sun would go down. And as a little kid, to the minute, you know, we'd be like, okay, okay, 30 more seconds, 30 more seconds. Yay, now we get to do whatever we want to do. <laughs> And God never, ever intended for any of these appointed times to be done legalistically, that it's something we have to do. It was always meant as a blessing that we get to rest in it. And so we actually had to leave keeping the Sabbath for a number of years to then come into it from a different perspective of rest, of entering into that. I, I enjoy Sabbath, but you know, if I can't get it on that day, you know, maybe I'll take the next day off. You know, it's not like it's this legalistic, rigid thing. But, and I, and I have to admit, I am a, a recovering workaholic. And so the Sabbath is really important to me because otherwise I would just keep working and working and working and working. And when we enter into that rhythm that God originated in the beginning, it's that place of I have to let go. It's kind of that idle thing. It's I have to let go of all that my effort and go, God, you know what? I'm trusting you to provide for me. And so I'm, I can unplug and I can take that day of rest. And I need that physically, I need it spiritually, I need it emotionally to enter into that place of rest. The next one is what we're going to be focusing on most tonight, and that's the monthly cycle. Because most of us are not, you know, aware of that. Again, we read new moon, new moon, new moon in the Old Testament, and it doesn't mean anything to us. Because we're used to going by our, you know, January, February, March calendar. But for the Jews, that was a very special time where they entered into some very specific things that we're going to be looking at next. And then God established a yearly cycle where they had um, three different feasts that they would get together and, and celebrate and enter into new levels with God. Now, many people go, well, that's just all that Jewish stuff and that was done away with. We don't have to enter into that anymore. But... These are appointed times that God gave to us. And if you were here two weeks ago, I talked about it. those are our Jewish roots, that God intended us to enter into those, that rhythm, the, his timing for all eternity. We'll look at some texts in just a minute that talk about those going into um, the New Jerusalem and so on. And it's kind of like your birthday. Now, do you have to celebrate your birthday? No, you don't have to. But why wouldn't you? It's a great time to go, you know what? I just celebrate the life that God gave me. We get together with family and friends, and we receive gifts, yes! <laughs> and it's a fun celebratory time. And that's what God intended for each of these appointed times, to not be a legalistic thing, not be something that we have to, but that as we enter into God's rhythm, there's extra blessing that we can enter into. So we're going to be focusing on New Moon or First Fruits. We prefer to call it our First Fruit Celebration, just because sometimes when you say New Moon, it kind of reminds some people of like New Age or something. What is that New Moon thing? And um, so we call it First Fruits. And there were four main things that we find in Scripture that they did in First Fruits. The first one is worship God. And this first verse, Isaiah 66, 23, is actually a prophetic word about the uh, New Jerusalem, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. So the, the New Moon Festival was a time, a special time to get together and just worship God, pour out our worship to Him. Secondly, it was a time to feast. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes as Christians, we get so focused on like the spiritual disciplines or fasting, and we think, oh, we have to... <sighs> But if you look in scripture, there's a lot of feasting going on. God loves a good party. 
And he's very much into that. And so this verse from 1 Samuel 20, 24, it says, And when the new moon had come, the king sat down to eat the feast. And so here at the Equipping Center, we really value feasting together. And that's why we start at 5 o'clock with a fellowship meal. And we'll be honest that um, that's a lot of extra work. We have to set up the tables and take them down. And it costs us more money because we're using the facility for longer. And we have to rent the kitchen and all of these things. But for us, it's worth it. Because it's time where we get to do life together. Where we get to know one another better and hear one another's heart that our relationship with God is not disconnected from our relationship with one another. And so we really value that time to just come together and enjoy one another, Amen. to hear how our week has been, to enter into that joyful fellowship. And actually, I'm not the greatest cook, and so I love to go on Sunday nights when I get to taste all this wonderful food. I'm sure my, my husband is happy too. So um, we love to feast. And then the next one was to seek prophetic guidance. And I shared a little bit on this two weeks ago, so I won't go too much into it. Just briefly the story about the Shunammite woman. She was very generous to the prophet Elisha, built a room on top of her house so that he always had a place to live. And in response, he <coughs> promised her a son. And she, was, she had been barren, gave birth to a son, he grew up. And one day he was out in the fields, and all of a sudden he collapsed. And they took him in. And he eventually died. Now, most of us, or at least I would, have been hysterical. I would have run out to my husband in the field going, fire! <laughs> but she didn't. She very calmly went out to her husband and said, I'm going to go see the prophet. And his response to her is in this verse, 2 Kings 4.23. Why are you going to see him today? It's neither the new moon nor the Sabbath. Is it well with you? And she said, it is well. She goes to the prophet Elisha, he comes back and raises their son to life. Yeah, yeah. But in this little verse, we get a picture into what they did back then. That at the new moon and at Sabbath, that was an often time when they would go seek prophetic counsel. To go, what's, what's about the month to come? What's the word of the Lord? And so, as my husband was sharing a little bit earlier, that's part of what we will do on First Fruits, is we will gather a, um, a prophetic group beforehand, and this is open to anybody. Um, we're actually, because of the shortened uh, time span, we're going to do this next Sunday at 1.30 at our house. Again, anybody is welcome. There'll be more information available on that. And it's just a time to, to pray, to study, to seek the Lord, and to kind of hear what is, what is the word of the Lord for this month. And then finally, it was a time to give. Numbers 29, 6 says, Besides the burnt offering and the grain offering for the new moon, a sweet aroma, an offering made by fire to the Lord. Now some people, when they go, well, what is first fruits giving? Isn't that the same thing as tithe? But it's very interesting, when we look at giving in Scripture, there is, there is a differentiation. And so this, these verses are from Nehemiah 10, and it lists three types of giving. First fruit giving, tithe, and offerings. And so that first verse, bring to the house of the Lord the first fruits of your crops, every fruit tree, the firstborn of our cattle, first of our ground meal, our grain, blah, 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 on and on and on. So it was the first portion. Now, we don't live in an agricultural society, but this would be like if we planted a big garden and we had lots of tomato plants, what were the, the first tomatoes that were ripe, we would go out and pick, and that would be our first portion that we would take and bring to the temple as our first fruits. So for us, um, in our society, we do currency very differently. It's not agricultural like that. We believe it's a time at the first of the month to just ask the Lord, God, what would you have us to give as our first fruit offerings? And it's between you and him. It might be a very small amount or it might be a large amount. It's between you and God what that looks like. Now, there are times when you might have a first fruits in your life. Um, when I write a book, and so the first proceeds from that book, then that would be my first fruit offering. Um, here at the Equipping Center, we believe in giving first fruits as a ministry as well. So the very first night that we met together, we took a portion of that offering and gave as our first fruits. And then the next one was tithe. Nehemiah 10.37, and bring a tithe of our crops, crops to the Levites. The Levites received the tithe. So kind of how it would work is they would bring their first fruits, that first portion, 
And then there would come the harvest, and they would count up at all their harvest at the end, and then they would take 10% of that, and that was their tithe. And so that's kind of the differentiation between first fruits versus tithe. And then they gave offerings. And these were free will, thanksgiving offerings, whatever God impressed on your heart, Nehemiah 10, 39. So what is the significance of first fruits giving? It's honoring God as your source, that he is the source of all your supply. You wouldn't have anything without him. So that giving him that first portion is a declaration that he has blessed you. Then it sanctifies or makes holy the rest of your income. Romans 11, 16 says, if the first fruits is holy, then the whole batch is holy. Now, I don't know about you, but I want all of my income blessed. <laughs> and so God's promise is that when we give that first portion to him, is that he causes there to be a blessing on all of the rest. And then it releases the fullness of God's blessing. Ezekiel 44, 30 says, give the first portion so a blessing may rest on your household. And also Ezekiel 44, 30, honor the Lord with your first fruits, that your barns will be filled to overflowing, and your vats will brim over with new wine. And your bank account, we want it to overflow, right? <laughs> and so that's the, the principle of giving that first portion. And so many people tithe, and, but don't know about first fruits. And again, this is part of our Jewish heritage, that we understand to enter into a greater level of God's blessing as we give first fruits. Now, I mentioned on our, on our vision night about God is a giver. That's who he is. You see, he lavishly pours out on us. He has given everything. Now, who were we made in the image of? God. Okay, that means that he created us to be givers. When we don't give, when we hold back because of fear, or insecurity, or stinginess, or anything else, we're not reflecting the image of God. And there's not a blessing in that. We talked also on the vision night about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. A lot of people, and me included for many, many years, have operated out of the tree of life, where it was like, God said give 10%, I'll give 10%. And I'll throw a couple of extra dollars in there for offering because I have to give and I want to receive God's blessing and because it's a good and right thing to do. And that's really operating out of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God wants us to operate out of the tree of life where this is a joyful thing, where we're reflecting his image. You know, there's some people who will come to a church and if there's too much talked about money, they will walk out the door and not come again. And that's not God's intention. It's not... It's just part of who he created us to be. And when we shut that down, we're not flowing in that tree of life place. And so we want to give with a joyful heart of love. We want to give where he asks us to give. Now, this is important to understand because as the Kingdom Equipping Center, we are not looking to you as our source. We're looking to God as our source. And that's why we don't take an offering, but we do give you opportunities to give. Not because we're desperate and, oh, please, give to us, we need money right now. But it's about giving you the opportunity to be blessed and to walk in the fullness of that. And so that's why we have the offering the way that we do, that it's an expression of your worship. It's also an expression of warfare. If you are in the midst of a battle, I encourage you to give. Not for our sake, but for yours. Because oftentimes that's a place of breakthrough. When we worship and when we give, that it breaks something off in the spirit and we're able to overcome the enemy. As I mentioned, the other part is prophetic guidance. Each Hebrew month is associated with a tribe. And so that's one of the ways that we look at prophetic guidance. For instance, this month, the month of Tammuz, is associated with the tribe of Reuben. And so we'll be looking in just a few minutes at Reuben's life and what that looks like. Another way is the Hebrew letters. Did you want to explain this, babe? Yeah. Okay. I got to share a little bit on this because, um, you know, some of you, this is totally foreign, I get that. Totally foreign to you, but... 
the uh, if you look at the book in the book of Exodus, you uh, and you know the story of the Exodus. It's a huge, major event in the Jewish and Israel his, in Israel, Israel's history. It's so major that God reorders the months because before the, the Exodus, the months actually started with Tishri, and you can go back and look at all that. But because this is such a huge event, He makes that first month. Or the, the fourth month, actually. Is that right? No. It, he makes Nisan. He makes Nisan the first month. That is the month that we have Passover. Okay? Or Easter. I don't like using that word. <laughs> but we have Passover in that month because they passed over from Egypt over the Red Sea. And that is a, that is a month where we learn to pass over and go into new seasons for our own life. So there's the whole reordering of the months, and then he also reordered the tribes of Israel. Because up until that point, it was by the birth order. But as they move over and into uh, the, uh, you know, Mount, and camp around Mount Sinai, he reorders them and puts them into a marching order. And in the marching order, Judah goes first. Judah is the month of praise and worship. I was going to ask that. Does anybody know what the month of Judah stands for? <laughs> associated with Nisan is Judah. Judah goes first, praise and worship, and entering into that place. Because where, how do we enter into his gates? Praise, praise and thanksgiving. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, God's got such a huge timetable and, and a massive plan for us. The question is, do you trust him with your life? Right now, with the things that you're going through. So he has a plan for you. The question is, do we, are we willing and able to let him run with it? That's the whole thing about tonight. Tonight is, is about this. It's the, um, if you boil it all down, this is the message for this month. This is how you walk out your faith, okay? If you're going to walk out your faith, faith without works is dead, right? So here are your works for this season. Trust God, wait on Him, and worship Him exuberantly while you wait. Those are your works, your faith works for this month. Let go of anything that you're holding on to that you're trying to make happen. How many of you know that uh, God's going to be able to do a thousand times more than you can on your best day? Yep. All right. So what would you rather have? What he wants for you or what you can do? Yeah. I've beat my head up against the wall long enough. I, I'm, I'm learning. I'm not completely there, but I'm learning to back off when I feel the resistance and let him move. So what's what's the next? Oh, uh, let me just say one thing too about the, the, the Hebrew letters. Again, we'll get into this at another time, but this is awesome. It's so awesome because the Hebrew letters, there's, there's letters that represent each month as well. And I'm just going to talk about the year for this point because we haven't even talked about the year. We are in the year 5775. It's the civil year, which I'm not going to get into all that. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun if you like to study that stuff. But we're in the civil year 5775, which means that they believe we are 5,775 years away from when Adam was created. Okay? It is represented by the letter Hey, which we get hallelujah and a lot of other wonderful words. And but it represents wind and pruma, the spirit of God. And then the other letter is ayan, which represents the eye. God sees all things. So you put those two together, and the prophetic word that has come out for this year is that, before we even entered into it, that we would be in a time and a season where there are going to be storms going on, big storms, and if you want to be safe, you need to be in the eye of the storm where it's peaceful. If you're in the eye of the storm, everything going on around you, you can just, you can just let it go. But if you get caught up in it, and you start reaching out and trying to grab onto things, you're just going to get sucked up in the whirlwind. But no, we need to stay at rest in the eye of the storm. So, um, and then we already went over what happened biblically. Let's look at the next one here. Um, so, the, the Reuben is the one that is associated with this month. And I'm just going to share with you the blessing, if you want to call it that, the blessing that was given to Reuben. 
This is what Jacob, his father, said over him. It sounds good at first. Reuben, now this is out of uh, Genesis 49, verse 3 and 4. Reuben, you are my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity and the excellency of power. It's good stuff. Verse 4. Unstable as water, you shall not excel. Does anybody know why? He says it right here. Because you went up to your father's bed, then you defiled it. Now, if you read the story of Reuben, he was looking for comfort. And instead of waiting on God to find out what, how God would give him that comfort, he went and found it on his own. Now, this contrast here between Reuben and Joseph just shows how one you know, response, response and attitude is everything. Joseph was blessed while Reuben was cursed. So Reuben represents this month, and it's a ticking time bomb sort of situation because you have strength, you have power, you have might, but it's unstable. So we have got to be careful in the season that we wait on the Lord, that we trust in Him, even though everything in us wants to jump and do what we know how to do, it's not the season for that. It's the season to wait and listen and release and watch Him work. Watch Him work in this season. <coughs> I'll let my wife take over again. Let's go linear. <laughs> All right. So we had uh, Reuben... We see his life, how he was the firstborn, he started off well, but he experienced a lot of trauma. They had uh, escaped from Laban, uh, Jacob's father-in-law. They had uh, encountered Esau, and again, but for the Lord's protection, they would have taken Jacob and his family out. They had gone to Shechem, and it was a place where uh, his sister was raped, and his brothers ganged up on the, the men in the city and killed them all. And they had to flee again. After that, uh, one of their favorite nurses, Deborah, died. And then Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin. And so in, in, in Reuben's life, it just felt like one trauma after another after <coughs> another. And as my husband shared, is he was like, I've, I've just got to have some comfort. And he chose to find comfort in the closest thing, which was his father's concubine. And that shifted his whole life in that he did not receive the inheritance that he normally would as the firstborn son. That was passed on to, to Joseph and his sons. And we see that the tribe of Reuben kind of followed along that, that path where they had been in the wilderness, they had gone through all those testing and trials, wandered 40 years in the wilderness, and they're finally getting towards the promised land. Now, the promised land that God had promised them was on the, the west side of the Jordan River. But they got just to the, the river, and they had defeated the king that was in that region. And Reuben and a couple of the, of the other tribes go, you know what? This is really good land right where we are. Why would we cross over into the land that God has promised us? Now, they did go over and help their, you know, clear out the land, but they never chose to enter in to the inheritance that God had promised them. They chose to stay on the other side of the river. And because of that, it had consequences. They were one of the first tribes to turn away into idolatry. They were one of the first tribes to be taken away into captivity as well. And then we, um, as... My husband mentioned already what happened in this month was the golden calf. And this is very significant. It's a month where we either worship the Lord with all of our hearts or we tend to worship idols. And so it's just that place of recognizing that all of us battle one way or another with different idols. Sometimes we look at the Israelites and go, oh man, they built a golden calf. How could they do that? How come they could have just waited two more hours? And yet in our own life, we see things that become more to us. Did, didn't Aaron say that he threw all that stuff in the fire and just jumped out? <laughs> yes, he did. <laughs> yes. yes, he did. But what is an idol? It's anything we seek for comfort, security, or identity more than God. 
And all of us are vulnerable to that. Uh, Gil and I have to watch that we don't make Kingdom Equipping Center our idol. No, it's not about this. It's about him. And if he says to shut this down tomorrow, we shut it down tomorrow because it's not an idol. It can't be. And so we, we need to examine and look at our lives and go, God, what am I battling with as an idol? What is something that I'm not willing to give up? Uh, or I'm placing more value on or any of those things. So I've just been really sensing, again, I've said this over and over today already, but there are some of you who are struggling with breakthrough. How many of you want to break through to something new? Right. Turn to somebody next to you and just say, I want to break through to something new. <laughs> All right. How many of you feel like you're waiting? Yeah, turn to your and say, I'm waiting. <laughs> If you're waiting, remember Joseph waited 13 years, Abraham waited 25 years, Moses waited 40 years, Jesus waited 30 years. Hopefully your waiting won't be that long. But the point is to trust God in that waiting time. All right, so we're going to move back into worship. And here's the thing, though. There, there are some of you who have prophetic words right now. I know you have prophetic words that you can give, that you want to give, that you're supposed to give.